Doing buzz. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, for those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today, we're doing a little bit of all of that. Uh, thank you to the classes who braved the weather all across Canada and the U.S. to be here today. Uh, and I want to take you guys to the research vessel Falcor, part of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. They are currently in the Gulf of California looking for new ways of life. So it's not just new species, it's the biology, geology, chemistry of this incredible uncharted area and how organisms can tap other sources other than the sun to make life possible. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Dr. Mandy Joy and her team, uh, who are going to share with us a little bit about what they do. Thanks so much, Mandy, and take it away. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we're coming to you from the research vessel Falcor. We're currently in transit in the Gulf of California, headed to the Guaymas Basin, uh, where, we'll, where we'll be diving uh, first thing in the morning. Today, we're going to tell you a little bit about the tools that we use to, to conduct our research in the deep sea. We'll give you a little bit of a background into the Gulf of California and some of the science and technology that we use to address the questions that we're addressing. So a little bit about the Gulf of California to start with. Could you put the slides up for me? So the Earth system is characterized by a series of interwoven, interconnected plates. And these plates are up on the screen that you see. And the little red arrow points to where we are in the Gulf of California. This is a really interesting era tectonically. The Gulf of California is a young ocean basin. So someday, hundreds of millions of years from now, the Gulf of California will be like the new Pacific Ocean. So we're studying the Gulf of California to understand how tectonic processes influence and basically determine the mode of life and the dynamics of life in the deep sea. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, Here's a little bit more about the Gulf of California. It's a really tectonically interesting and fascinating place. The Pacific place plate is moving to the northwest. Um, the North American plate is sliding to the southeast. And the, the tension created by those plates slipping past one another and the spreading of the plate in between them creates new ocean crust. And that material has it, it is, emerges from the bottom of the Gulf of California in the places that kind of go from, from southeast to northwest, and the other lines are sort of the tensional faults. So the Gulf of California has a number of different spreading centers. Guaymas Basin is one, which we'll be visiting, as I said, for the next week or so. Um, but in all of these places, new ocean crust is being formed, and it flows up through, through the sediment and impacts processes there. So I'm going to talk a little bit first about the, the very briefly about the system. Um, Russ will give you an overview of the ROV Sebastian. Leighton's going to tell you about a little bit about the other activities that we're going to be doing on board, including mapping and water sampling with the CTD. Um, but in terms of the system, this is a place, uh, the Gulf of California is one of the most productive marine habitats on Earth. It's incredibly diverse biologically. There are a number of world heritage sites here. Um, some of you have probably heard of the vaquita porpoise, which is in the northern of the Gulf of California. It's an endangered species. There aren't very many left, and its ecology is not very well understood. There, this, this place is home to just about every whale species uh, that you can think of, um, from blue whales to humpback whales. There are even a, a pod of Pacific killer whales that, that, that like to come in and feed uh, and in the southern part of the, part of the system. This happens to be whale breeding season, uh, so we're, we're looking forward to maybe seeing some whales on this expedition. Um, but the, the diversity of life is both large and small. Most of the people on board actually study life that's on the smaller side, and we'll see what those microorganisms are a little bit later. But first, let's get an introduction into the technology that we use to explore this system. Russ? Hi, hi there, everyone. My name's Russ. Uh, I'm the ROV supervisor on board. Um, as you can see, this area that we're in just now is actually what we call the control room. So, as you can see, multiple screens, uh, we set it up in such a way that we have obviously a pilot station so that you can actually fly the ROV and you can get instructions from the chief scientist, which is obviously on the left hand side. Um, all the screens can be configured in multiple ways to suit pilot configuration, uh, etc. We've got a winch control here because obviously the, the, the ROV is connected at all times to the, the ship. So we have a large winch uh, actually on the top deck and we've got 4,500 meters of wire which is connected to Sebastian at all times. Um, what we do then is we can control how much wire we have from this handle here. We can actually pay out and bring up depending on the water depths. Um, this will be the co-pilot station. So the co-pilot would then be monitoring any navigation 
uh, keep an eye on any sonar targets, uh, updating the chart as any uh, new features or, or piece of interest might be coming into. Um, up on here, obviously, these screens can be configured. We have a co-pilot pilot screen. We have, actually have a little chart up there just now. We normally have this set up for the job, so whatever we're doing that day, we'll actually have that chart set up. And we can actually put waypoints and uh, targets onto that so we can drive to it. Uh, normally, we'd have a screen where you can actually see a little outline of the ROV. We can actually see that moving along when using all our instrumentation. Uh, the ROV itself has got quite a number of uh, things on it. So we've got sonar on there. There's uh, multiple light systems on there. Uh, we have a sled that we can use for adding things like core sampling tools, fluid sampling tools. And we also have multiple junction boxes, so we can actually add in extra instrumentation uh, depending on the scientists higher for that particular task. So what I'll do is I'll pass you over to Lake and he's going to give you some insight into things like the, the other technology we have on the ship for doing mapping and Hello, um, my name's Leighton. Um, second. The right one. Okay, my name's Leighton. I'm the lead technician on board the ship. So as well as uh, being a mothership to um, Sebastian, Falco itself is actually an advanced research ship. So on board we have numerous systems that allow us to map the ocean. One of these systems is currently running at the moment in the background. We're actually transiting to our first work site. And what this is, is a multi-beam echo sounder system. And we're currently mapping the seabed in three dimensions. We go along our cost track is a few kilometers. So uh, each side of the ship, there's about Ooh, I'd say 1,500 meters to 2,000 meters that we're mapping as we go along. And we use this for numerous reasons. First of all, most of the oceans but and high resolution maps only cover a small fraction of the world's oceans. Also, we use them to uh, prepare charts for our ROV dives. Before we dive Sebastian in the next few days, we'll transit over some known vent fields and try and get a feel, also try and isolate some of the plumes that are coming out of these hydrothermal vents. In addition to the multi-beam systems, and we have two, one deep water system that is capable of going down to 8,000 meters, we also have another system that goes down to roughly 1,500 meters, but is higher resolution. For the majority of this cruise, though, we'll be using our deep system. We also have um, systems for fisheries and um, bioacoustics. These also help us identify vents. So we can find anything from plankton, really up to the big whales that Mandy was just talking about. We also have another system called a sub-bottom profiler. This is a system that actually looks into the seabed so we can see all the different uh, layers of mud that make up the seabed. And this system can generally give us a, f um, a few tens of meters into the seabed. Other systems, we have acoustic Doppler current profilers. Now, these are just fancy words for um, systems that monitor the currents that are under the ship. Now, these are important for understanding the movement of um, particles in the water and any life, but also for helping us plan the ROV dives. We know from operating here previously, there's some pretty strong currents in the area. The ship's also fitted with some other systems like hydrophones, which is great for when we're operating around Hawaii and other locations. We can hear the whales singing. And we have other systems such as advanced um, global navigation systems, which allow us to pinpoint our position to just a few meters, which is great. I mean, all these cool things that we're finding out on these missions, we actually need um, to uh, put a pin on a map and say where we found them. So we can revisit them and scientists in the future can come back and look at the cool things that we found. Over to Mandy and Professor Joy and she will carry on. Hi. So questions about the ROV or the ship's capabilities before we start moving into some more detail about what these deep ecosystems in the Gulf of California look like? We certainly could do that, uh, or we could do the whole presentation and do all the questions at the end if you guys want. It's entirely up to you. That's fine. You want to roll the video? Yeah, we'll roll the video. The video is about 10 minutes. Cool. And I will narrate, and then we'll have the rest of the time left for questions. Great. Thanks so much. Let's see now. We're going we're gonna to go down into the bottom of the Gulf of California, and we're going to see what um, we're going to see the view that we would have um, from either a submersible or a remotely operated vehicle. The, the video that we're going to show is it starts from the, the tail of the ship. So the ROV is going in the water. When the ROV goes in the water, it takes about an hour and 15 minutes to the bottom in 2,000 meters of water. 
And once on the bottom, we can see some really spectacular features. Hydrothermal are not what most people expect. There's an incredible mesmerizing terrain of pipes and fissures and terraces, pagoda-like structures, um, where fluids exit the seabed in sometimes uh, pretty spectacular fashion. These chimneys are precipitated by minerals. Um, some of the minerals are derived from the hydrofluid. Some of it is derived from uh, the mixing seawater. These fluids come into the Gulf of California at a number of different spots along the, the axis of those seams that were before. If you look closely at some of these geological features, you can see animals living under a little scale worm on the outside of that chimney feature. The chip can be hundreds of degrees centigrade because at the pressure of the deep sea, water doesn't boil at 100 degrees, about 400 plus degrees centigrade. So these animals that live around these features have some interesting characteristics and commonalities that go between the free living microorganisms to the organisms that are associated uh, with the animals that live in these environments. So in the deep sea, it's obviously dark, it's cold. Around these chimneys, it can be quite hot. Um, but there's a lot of energy available if you can figure out a way to metabolically capture it. And these microorganisms do that. And they, they capture chemical energy that's coming from the hydrothermal fluids. And they use that energy to basically grow and produce biomass. And we'll see some pictures of those organisms in just a couple of minutes. But right now, I want you to sort of get an appreciation for the diversity of geologic features. So this is another vent um, that's putting out a pretty good clip of hydrothermal fluid. And you can see that the fluid that's coming out of these chimneys, a lot of times the fluid's turbid. And when it mixes with seawater, you get what looks like cloudy, turbid water. This fluid's pretty clear. And, and a lot of the precipitation that happens is happening um, in and around the underside of those chimneys, which generates these large features that sort of grow upward into these towering terraces. Here's another example of gas bubbling out of the bottom. And this is what happens when you trap that gas in a core tube. It, it, sure. So this picture in front of you now is a microbial mat field in the Guaymas Basin. These microbial mat fields are spectacular. They're very colorful. The color tells you a lot about the metabolism of the organisms because the colors represent kind of enzymes and, and, and pigments that they have uh, inside their cells. It tells you a little bit about their metabolism. If you take a closer look, they look a little like spaghetti when you look at them under the microscope. Here's a Begiatoa mat. Begiatoa is um, oxidized sulfur for a living. If you look in close, you'll see animals associated with them. There's a lot of three-dimensional structure to these mats, uh, both in the lateral and the vertical. They're actually quite smart microorganisms, and the little orifices in these mats promote fluid flow and oxygen penetration into the mats. If you look at them under the microscope, here's what you see. Again, it looks a little bit like spaghetti, long filaments with, with segmentations that align cellular processes. And you can see, I think there's one more close-up shot um, this was taken under a, a microscope at 40x, and you've got orange and white. Orange filaments have a particular uh, carotenoid uh, that, the, uh, that the white filaments do not. These organisms are very ancient. They've been around for a long time, billions of years. They have figured out how to optimize their metabolism so that they get everything they need uh, in the deep, dark bottom of the ocean. And you get carpets of these billowing mats on top of geologic structures. It's not just microorganisms, though. You can have anemones, sponges, two worms, mussels, scale worms, isopods, just about every type of animal that you can imagine has figured out a strategy to allow it to survive uh, in the deep sea. All, all kinds of, of classes of animals across various walks of life. Uh, these are chemosymbiotic tube worms. These organisms actually farm their own bacteria inside a sort of adapted belly. They have the a, a, a organ called a tropisome where they grow bacteria and they harvest those bacteria to fuel their metabolism. So animals in the deep sea can be either scavengers or they can be partnering with an organism to form a symbiosis like these, these tube worms that we see in this picture. And these tube worms can form vast meadows. Um, there are places in the Gulf of California that you can drive for, for, for several minutes and you're just driving along over the top of a tube worm meadow that never seems to end. Um, the same thing goes for, for mussel beds or clam beds. There's a lot of different animals that just proliferate because of the abundance of energy that's flowing from the seabed. 
And all of these organisms that I've talked about so far are, are what we call chemosynthesis. They do chemosynthesis. So they take chemical energy and they use that to oxidize these chemicals. They get energy out of that oxidation and they use that energy to produce biomass and they grow. Um, and then they can either be harvested by other animals, basically consumed or, or eaten by other animals, or they can grow to large abundance in these microbial mats. Then we have the scavengers. Um, organisms like here, um, various fish and invertebrates, they go along the seabed and they, they essentially munch on, consume, devour um, the various microorganisms that live in the muds and in the microbial mats. So there's a very tightly coupled ecosystem that exists in the deep sea. And it, it's quite spectacular. The Guaymas Basin and the Pescadero Basin in particular here in the Gulf of California are really unique in that you have a lot of organic rich sediment that's interacting with this hydrothermal fluid and that generates a variety of organic molecules that can feed other animals that would otherwise not be able to survive here. So the very spectacular balance between chemistry and biology and the physics of water movement creates a habitat where life thrives despite the fact that it's cold, dark, and at very high pressure. You even get organisms like the giant tube worm Riftia, which is shown here. These tube worms can be up to two meters in, in, in height. Very, very, very large organisms that thrive here in the deep sea um, despite the high temperatures, despite the nasty uh, sulfitic hydrothermal fluid, um, despite all of the challenges that they're, they're up against, they thrive, they're incredibly abundant and quite diverse across the axis of the system. So for us, this is an amazing ecosystem to work in. We get to witness uh, these spectacular features that, that really are, are quite unique to this area. And our job on this expedition is to try and figure out what the connection is and what the driving forces are between hydrothermal fluid discharge, microbial dynamics, and the higher animals that, that interact with and feed upon these organisms. So we're going to be doing quite a bit of exploration over the next few weeks. Uh, we're very excited to get started tomorrow um, in, the, in the southern trough of the Guaymas Basin. This area is, is, is part of that spreading ridge on the southern Guaymas Trough. Um, we have some preliminary data from there. This, is, this image is from, uh, this, from a large terraced feature on the southern Guaymas Trough. And if you look close on this rock, you'll see that it's not just a rock. Uh, there's a microbial biofilm that lives on this rock. And there are worms that are basically harvesting and, and eating those microorganisms that uh, they're basically, if you will, a little bit farming the biofilm on, on top of the rock. And here, here we are sampling the microbial mats. Uh, we use the sediment core and we go down into the mat and we can collect a profile of sediment. Then we can analyze that sediment back up here in the lab on board the ship and determine the chemical cocktail that's fueling the processes that we see uh, in the sediments. The rocks are a little bit harder. You can't really profile the rocks but we can collect the rocks and we can take pieces of the rock and, and do the same kinds of incubations and look at particular rates of processes just like we do in the sediments. But one thing we do in the rocks that we can't do in the sediments is look at the chemical composition of the fluids. And that's what's shown here. This is a major sampler where we're putting it into one of these caverns to get a fluid sample to see how the chemistry of the cavern is unique. And that's that you can you can see this there. You you place it up where you think the fluid is flowing out, or where you can witness the fluid uh, flowing out, and you get a chemical signature later when you bring it back up into the lab and do the analysis. So here's one uh, final set of, of images from the the Guaymas Basin. Here we've got really rapid fluid discharge uh, from a hydrothermal feature that we call Alvin Spire, and this is a pretty spectacular feature. It's about 15 to 20 meters tall. Um, the top part of the tower is just a field of, of chimneys and flow features. And we discovered this site on a dive that we did back here in, in November of last year. Um, but it was a pretty amazing dive because we really didn't have any idea that those kinds of features uh, were going to be present in the particular habitat where we were looking. So th that's one of the interesting things about working in the deep sea. You go out with what you, 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 you sort of know what you might find. Um, you, you think you might find something spectacular, but you're not always sure. Uh, but more often than not, uh, you're more surprised by, by what you find because it's even more spectacular than you ever could have imagined. Uh, this, this field here was at the top of that spire I mentioned before. Um, we were not expecting to see anything like this. This is about, I'd say, four to five meters across. 
a pretty extensive feature. And at the bottom of it, um, all kinds of mineral precipitates and, and carbonate rocks with, with iron sulfur, that's the iron, or iron, iron oxides is the orange overgrowth, iron sulfur is the dark overgrowth. Uh, but these features are both geologically and biologically extremely diverse, um, but just teeming with life. And we hope to, throughout the course of this expedition, be able to, to document and explore some new modes of metabolism that we're interested in tracking. And the rates of these processes are believed to be elevated um, in, in the habitats we're, we're going to be studying uh, to, to an extent that we might be able to really nail them down and, and document them in a way that we wouldn't be able to in environments where things were happening at a little bit of a slower pace. So I'm happy to take your questions. Um, and Russ and Leighton are here. They can also answer any questions you might have about the, about the ROV or the ship in general. Outstanding. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Joy. That was amazing. Uh, so yeah, let's start with Mr. Laveau's class. And so we'll do, because Mr. Laveau's class has more people uh, in Kitchener, there's only the one of you. So we'll do two and then one, and we'll get as many as, in as we can. So yeah, let's head to North Palm Beach. You guys have a question? Come on up. That's great. Go ahead, Emerson. If you could take the ship anywhere to explore, where, where would you go? And why? And why? So if you didn't catch that, if you could go... If you could go anywhere you want with a ship, where would you go and why? Oh, if I could go anywhere that I wanted to with a ship, gosh, is is it unlimited time? Because I think I would go everywhere if there were if there was no unlimited time. If there's limited time, um, I'm going to limit it to places where I haven't been before, and I think the Southwest Indian Ocean uh, would be my pick because it's an area where there is some really interesting and unique Stop types of, of hydrothermalism of yeah. um, and in combination with areas that are very highly productive. So you, you, might, be, you might find some systems that are similar to the Guaymas Basin, um, but yet quite different because the hydrothermal regime is, is, is distinct. Um, the Indian Ocean is very unexplored relative to the Atlantic and Pacific. We don't know nearly as much about it. And if you want a high potential for discovery, you want to go somewhere where you have a little bit of data that suggests something's really interesting, um, but you don't really know what you're going to find. So it's wide open, too. Outstanding. Uh, all right, Mr. Laveau's class again, if you have a second question, come on up. David, go ahead. Get in the screen so we can hear you. Have you ever had trouble with another boat or country while exploring? I don't know if you heard David. Have you had ever had another ever had trouble with another country or boat while exploring? Okay. No, generally with generally with um, science. Before we go on an expedition, we apply for a permit to work, work in that nation's water. Um, usually, we'll take observers and participants from that nation. So, generally, as this is a science vessel, it's for the good of all those who are involved. So. We ask permission, we go in there with scientists from the local area. And this expedition has scientists from Mexico on board and from further afield. So no, generally we do not have um, problems with um, countries. They may stipulate where we can work and the type of work that we can do. But generally, this is a really good opportunity for cooperation. Excellent. And on the science side, it's, it's really important that you develop collaborations in country because that, that, that way you're, you're, you're not just benefiting your own science, but you're you're, you're benefiting the science of, of the home country as well. Awesome, thank you so, so much, guys. Uh, all right, let's head to Kitchener. You have a question. What do you have to study to be able to do this? Good question. You can study, you can study anything and, and do this. I've had students in my lab that majored in biology or chemistry. I've had students that did biomedical engineering. I've had students that studied history and philosophy and then decided they wanted to become an oceanographer. I think it's really important to have a broad background. Um, you, you clearly, to be an ocean scientist, you will, in graduate school, if not before, study physics and chemistry and biology and geology and a little bit of everything else. We use tools from, from medicine and molecular biology. We use tools from geology and geophysics. We use tools from analytical chemistry, from geochemistry across the board. I mean, the, the key is to, to not limit yourself in terms of what your background is. I think that um, having a broad education that includes hard science as well as arts and literature is probably the most advantageous because it keeps your creative side uh, a little more honest than, than diving directly and solely into a hard science. 
and I think from our side, um, so we have our scientists on board, then we also have our technical team. And a lot of our technical team have come through various backgrounds. We've got people who actually come from engineering backgrounds, um, like technicians as well, people who've come from computer science backgrounds. It's a whole range of um, uh, things, especially we've also had uh, people who work just with cameras, because as you can imagine, a vehicle like Sebastian has 4K cameras, HD cameras, and just a wealth of experience from different areas. So it's not just the sciences, there's also other uh, traits and skills that you can have to get on board a ship like Falco. Outstanding. Actually, one of the things that I want to note for our classes that are here is every time we do a hangout with Falcor, you guys really highlight this point that if you want to get on a vessel like this, that not even just technical or scientific jobs, being a cook, being someone who works with cameras, digital media, like there are a lot of opportunities to end up in exploration in some form or other. And uh, so we appreciate you guys highlighting that. And we love the question. All right. Uh, and whoever's dealing with your camera where it's like we show cool stuff on the ship as you guys are talking, well done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, let's head to Mr. Laveau's class again. Go ahead, guys. Yes, hi. Um, Ishmael, do you want to ask your question? Or do you want me to ask it for you? All right, Ishmael's question was, um, tomorrow when you guys go diving, you're going to use a lot of remote submersibles. Will any humans dive? And if so, how far, how deep can they go? So, so there, that will be, uh, it will we'll be actually diving, diving at 2,000 meters tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, there's no actual people going inside this particular vehicle, it's actually an ROV, so it's remotely operated from the top side control system here. So there's a big wire connecting it from the ship, that goes all the way down, and that allows us to communicate with the vehicle. It's got a fiber optic um, inside, so that allows communications. We've got electrical wires inside the armor, which allows us to transmit power down to the hydraulics. But basically everything that we do on no board right now, we actually have the ROV, which is an unmanned. Uh, but we do control it from the surface. Uh, the actual full, sorry. I was just going to say, out of curiosity, in addition to that, though, is there ever any, on any of your expeditions, any human diving? Do you ever use submersibles? I mean, ROVs are amazing. I'm just curious. I, I, use, I use submersibles quite a bit. Um, and it's, it's much more, there's only one uh, manned submersible in the UNOLS fleet right now, and that's the Albin. Um, so to get time in the Alvin is very difficult. Um, there are a couple of privately owned um, submersibles that are available, made available to science uh, through philanthropy. Um, but you know, for us, ROV dives are just as as good, if not better, because you tend to get um, there, there. There are advantages and disadvantages, and I spend a lot of time talking about each. It's amazing to be on the bottom of the ocean and see it with your own eyes. Um, but having said that, the advantage of an ROV is that you just, it, it takes the, the, the physical pressure of doing the diving in the submarine, which is exhausting over the course of an expedition, a little bit out, and I think you're a lot sharper, and you tend to get maybe a, a, a bigger, you know, science payload with an ROV than you might with a, with a sub, but they're, there are definite positives to each, and I, I wouldn't want to have to pick one or the other. I like to be able to do both. I think the one major positive we'll play on here is that because we're remotely operated and we are connected to the vehicle, we can actually beam the video like yes. we're doing now yes. straight to yes. shore so that you guys can see it and participate in those dives and feel like part of that exploration. Yeah, yeah. can't do that with, a, with an HIV just yet. One of the coolest things that we've done on, on numerous research vessels before is this idea that you can literally watch live with the people that are on the vessel, top scientists in the world, top technicians, uh, this incredible exploration of new places. It's so amazing. So thank you guys for that. And if for the classes, if you guys get a chance to look up Alvin, I know there are benefits to ROVs, but Alvin's very romantic and very exciting, so do check that out. <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, another question from Mr. Laveau's class, and then we'll head back to Kitchen. Go right ahead, guys. Does anybody have another question? No? No. No, yeah. We'll come back. <laughs> Alice, what do you think? Any other questions? What is the most interesting thing that you found while you're on this expedition? On this expedition? Um, let me tell you the most interesting thing that I found in the Guayama space in which we're going um, to actually sample on this expedition. So when we were out previously working in the Gulf of California, what, what tends to happen often at sea is that you, you get some interesting data during the course of your cruise and you 
come up with a plan to evaluate um, how good of a target this is. And so through the course of your expedition, you hit these targets and some are good and some are better and some are fantastic. Um, but it seems to always happen that on the last dive of the expedition, you find something just absolutely mind boggling that you, you can't believe that you waited until the last dive. And, and in, in our case, it wasn't just the last dive. It was like the last 40 minutes of the dive when we had no sampling um, material left. So all we could do was take video. So we will be going to this place tomorrow um, and sampling these features tomorrow. Um, and I'm really excited and full of anticipation because you know, when we were there um, with the Alvin, it was one of those dives that you just can't believe this is really in front of your eyes. I mean, the things that you see sometimes defy your imagination and you really, I have had moments in the submarine where I was like, this can't be real. I, I have fallen asleep and I'm hallucinating or I'm dreaming, this is not real. And then you kind of pinch yourself and you're like, it is real, oh my goodness, wow. I can't believe I'm seeing this. And you know, you sometimes like, for on that dive, we were the first people to ever see that. So we, we discovered something spectacular and we were the first people to ever document it. And now we're gonna be able to go back with Sebastian and actually sample it and characterize it and do a lot better job of, of photo documenting it uh, for posterity. So that, that's really exciting. And I think you know, the other, we have a couple of other targets that we'll be uh, hitting later this week that are very similar. We, 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 we've got a lot of data that suggests these are super interesting places but we've never been there before, so it's really exciting to be able to finally get the opportunity to sample these places. Super cool. I, I want to note for the classes too, just because it's hard to get a context, but the number of people who've been down to the bottom of the ocean in a submersible is probably in the history, course of history in the hundreds, maybe a thousand, but probably in the hundreds. So it's a really rare opportunity, something really, really neat, and again, something that no one's ever explored before. Um, one question we get in a lot of expeditions, guys, is how long are the trips? How long are you guys actually out at sea? So typically, expeditions are sort of a minimum of two weeks, and they can be up to two months. Um, really long expeditions you know, to remote places can, can, can last for quite some time. Um, we boarded the ship on February the 8th, and we disembark on March the 14th. So we've been on the ship for a while. Um, but I think, you know, when you, when you think about what goes into carrying out an expedition like this, we started planning this expedition well over a year ago. And, and in earnest, you know, the past you know, six to eight months have been, you know, part of every single day um, has been dedicated to, to planning this expedition out. And even, even putting in all that, you know, preparation, you still have to fly by the seat of your pants a little bit. Um, when you're doing true exploration because you don't know where you're going to find. So it, it, you know, most expeditions are, are, I'd say, average maybe three to four weeks. Um, but I also want to comment on, the, on, the, on how many people have been to the bottom of the ocean. So, so back in November, we did the 5,000th Alvin dive. So Alvin has done 5,000 dives uh, since 1964. I take it back. Think about, <laughs> yeah. So when you think about that it's 5,000 dives and it's three people in the submarine each dive, it's not, I don't know how many people, but it is not a lot of people. And, you know, the, and I think we, we, we're really thankful for the opportunity and grateful to be able to, to, to participate in that. But, you know, the same thing goes for RV dives. I mean, I don't know how many RV dives have been to the bottom of the ocean for science purposes, you know, not, for in, not counting industry. Um, but for true exploration, you know, it, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's not common. It's uncommon to do what we do. And, and that makes it even more special. Outstanding, guys. So we're getting close to time. So what I want to do is, whether it's you three on the ship, uh, Logan, if you want to jump in as well, can you tell us where classes can learn more, how they can participate, uh, whether it's with this expedition or other ones coming up? Uh, we'd love to hear that. Sure. We have lots of different social media. Um, uh, Dr. Joy has been writing blogs for this expedition here. So a lot of the best places to go will be the home base, which is www.schmittocean.org. Um, you can find us on any social media at, at Schmidt Ocean. And uh, on the website, you will be able to, again, keep up with the blogs that are coming, uh, that come live. We'll have weekly videos. We will also have live streams of the ROV dives. Um, so, yeah, the best place to go would be to come to our website or to come to our Facebook, where you'll find links to everything else. Outstanding. 
Anything else in the ship? Other thoughts? Thanks for joining us and keep yep. keep keep following us because I mean tomorrow the fun really begins. Yeah. Sounds exciting. Well, good luck, guys. It's super exciting, and I hope it goes uh, beyond your wildest dreams in terms of what you find. So thank you so much for joining us, guys. Have a thank wonderful you. Take care. Have a good day. Okay, guys. Bye for now.